Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Cafe Sci on the 6th of September, 2022. My name is Brad Peroni at Carnegie Science Center, and I am very, very pleased to be joined this evening uh, by researchers from the Integrative Ecology Lab at Temple University. The IECO Lab, the Integrative Ecology Lab, uh, is part of the Center for Biodiversity, which encompasses several Temple University laboratories involved in biodiversity research. The mission of the IECO Lab is to integrate biodiversity science with human ecology to understand contemporary patterns of biodiversity and its functioning within ecosystems. And we have four representatives from the IECO Lab with us this evening, who I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, but before we do that, I want to make sure all of our audience members know that in the bottom of your Zoom window, you will find a Q&A box. And so as you're listening to the presentations this evening, feel free to go ahead and enter any questions that you would like to ask. Uh, we're going to present those questions to this panel at the end of the talk. So uh, by all means, go ahead and uh, pop those questions in the Q&A before you forget and uh, I would also be remiss if I did not thank our sponsor for Cafe Sci, PPG, uh, and all of the wonderful members in our audience who have made financial contributions to keep Cafe Sci going. And if you'd like to continue to support Cafe Sci, one of the best things you can do is bring a friend. Uh, so next month when we go back on site at the Carnegie Science Center, uh, come on down, show up and bring a friend or two and Cafe Sci will be all the better for it. But as promised, I'll introduce our speakers for this evening. I will uh, be happy to introduce Dr. Matthew Helmus, Principal Investigator at iEco Lab. Uh, Dr. Stephanie, oh, and oh my goodness, I'm sorry, I forgot to uh, check pronunciations with everybody because we had four people here. So if I get it wrong, please uh, just correct me and I will get it right after that. Uh, Dr. Stephanie uh, Lukowitz, is that right? Uh, it's not right, but you know, Feel free to uh, tell us the right way to pronounce your name. Uh, postdoctoral researcher, uh, Dr. Nadej Beluard, postdoctoral researcher, and Dr. Sebastiano de Bona, postdoctoral researcher, uh, all at IECO Lab at Temple University. So we're going to first pass the mic over to Dr. Helmus uh, to kick us off. And please uh, tell us a little bit about your area of interest and uh, we will be under hey well thank you brad for that uh introduction so my name is matt helmus i'm a um, quantitative ecology professor at temple university my background is in um, uh, mostly ecological research and so i've done a lot of catching things like lizards and, and currently spotted lanternfly and i also do a lot of statistics and uh, mathematical modeling as well um, and so today i'm going to talk to you about um, the type of work that we do mostly on predictive modeling of spotted lanternfly um, this invasive insect that pittsburgh now has and it's uh, you know making its way across the united states um, i'm going to share a couple of links in um, the chat um, at the end of my talk um, that uh, links to the, in it, the apps that we built uh, for our predictive modeling, and also a recent paper that um, explains some of the concepts that I'm gonna be talking about um, today, just to introduce uh, these ideas. Uh, once I'm done introducing uh, these ideas, then I'm gonna pass it off to the three postdocs and they'll um, get into nitty gritty of the types of predictive modeling that we do. So spotted lanternfly, is typical of a lot of invasive pests or invasive species and all invasive pests exhibit three stages to invasion. The first stage is that they have to be transported by humans. So a population of a pest has to be, typically it's accidentally moved to a new location. So spotted lanternfly um, was transported from China probably in 2012, 2013, we don't know, we found it in 2014. Um, on some landscaping stone to Berks County in southeastern Pennsylvania. It was about 50 kilometers uh, from, from uh, Philadelphia. Now, once an invasive pest is transported to a new location, um, then the only way that it survives is if it established. And that basically means that it has to start reproducing faster than it's gonna die. Now, if spotted lanternfly would have landed way up north in Alaska, it would have not been able to reproduce fast enough because it's way too cold up there. But 
in Pennsylvania and in uh, uh, much of the United States, much of the continental United States, spotted lanternfly outbreaks are increasingly common, and they're facilitated by um, the spread of an invasive uh, host tree that I'll talk about quickly. And then finally, once spotted lanternfly established in Pennsylvania, its impact to economic livelihoods, to ecosystems, to agriculture, um, only occurs if it starts to spread and lanternfly has spread and it's starting to uh, impact uh, agriculture, innovative vineyards in particular. So these are grapevines. I have seen yield loss and even in some cases vine death. So the type of work that we do is we look at this transport and we try to understand how trade from the invaded region of the US is going to spread spotted lanternfly. And so this is just a, a, a recent paper that we published that looks at their establishment potential, which is all that red color, red and orange color. And you can see that a, a good chunk of the United States um, uh, can have spotted lanternfly established. And then what states most frequently trade with the invaded states? And those are uh, marked in the, the gray lines there. And you can see that California is one of those states. Uh, and California also has a ton of purple dots on there. And those purple dots are these important wine growing areas. And so everywhere there, where there's a purple dot is an area that does not want to get spotted lanternfly. Um, but uh, it does seem, based on our analysis, that they're at a really high risk of getting spotted lanternfly. Spotted lanternfly can establish so well because about uh, you know, 200 years ago, um, uh, uh, just outside in, just outside of uh, Pennsylvania or uh, just outside of Philadelphia, um, uh, there was importation of the tree of heaven, which is this Chinese tree, which is really fast growing. And it's now spread across the United States and the spotted lanternfly loves to eat it. And so as soon as spotted lanternfly was transported to Berks County, it found tree of heaven, its favorite host. And so it hatched, it found the tree it liked to eat. It started eating that tree. It grew really rapidly, started laying eggs and then started spreading. So tree of heaven is found across the United States and even across the globe. And so very often when we see tree of heaven, whenever there's spotted lanternfly outbreaks, you see just hundreds, if not thousands of lanternfly covering these trees. They don't just eat tree of heaven. They also eat lots of other species. And so that's really where their impact uh, comes into play because it has a really wide host range, including grapes and apples, plums, cherries, et cetera. So what we do in the Integrative Ecology Lab on spotted lanternfly, um, we do a lot of different things, um, but, but for spotted lanternfly in particular, we focus on predictive modeling. So I want to just give you three uh, basic concepts of predictive modeling that'll help you understand how to interpret what you're going to hear next from the three postdocs. So we do predictive modeling of spotted lanternfly, and we really look at the growth. So how fast it's going to grow? Does it reproduce faster than it dies? And then dispersal. So how it disperses both naturally and also how it disperses unnaturally um, by humans uh, accidentally moving the eggs or moving individuals around. So inherently, predictive modeling is forecasting. And so just like weather forecasts, weather forecasts are always not, are not perfect. It's just assessing some type of risk. And so predictive modeling is forecasting. So if we think about weather forecasting in the context of, of predictive modeling of, of invasive species, like what we do, weather forecasting is the most sophisticated forecasting that humans have ever developed on Earth at any other time in history. But even a 10-day weather forecast is only right about half the time. We have these satellites monitoring Earth, taking pictures. We have incredibly complicated and sophisticated mathematical climate models, and we still can't predict what 10 days out the weather is going to be. And so if we think about that, these long-term weather forecasts are very coarse. Like, for example, this is the estimate you know, of, of what uh, the winter would look like last year. Um, and this was the best, best uh, forecast that we had uh, from NOAA at that time. And so that's exactly what we're doing with our assessments. They tend to be quite coarse because predicting where a species is going to spread um, is, is really, really difficult. And the reason that it's really difficult is that nature is inherently complex. And I, I'm using the term complex in a scientific way, meaning that you can't predict it. It's just very, very complex, like a hurricane. And so predictive modeling is inherently what's termed complexity science. And complexity is what arises in anything you're looking at, any sort of system in which many different agents interact. And by agents, I mean lanternfly or humans or other things. And so in which many different agents interact and they adapt to one another in their environments. So complex systems are really difficult to forecast with really high accuracy. The spotted lanternfly invasion that we're trying to predict is an incredibly complex system. 
the agents in that system are the spotted lanternfly, the humans, the plant host. And if you're trying to predict what any sort of human is going to do at any given time, you can imagine trying to predict thousands and, and, and even millions of humans and how they might spread lanternfly, much less trying to predict what lanternfly is going to do. So it's incredibly uh, difficult. And so the first take home message that I want you to take home and think about when you're seeing these talks by our postdocs is that predictive models of spotted lanternfly population dynamics, the spread that we're looking at, they can only tell you about risk, but they cannot tell you what will absolutely happen. Just like the weather forecast cannot tell you if it will absolutely rain a month from now. And so finds that we're seeing, such as in um, Indiana, they're not forecastable, but they are very much expected. This introduction to spotlight fly to Southern Indiana was just because someone from Pennsylvania moved to, to Indiana and they accidentally brought some spotted land fly with them. There is no way to predict those types of, of movements because thousands are happening you know, every single day and we just can't predict that. And so whenever we're thinking about these models and these apps that we're using, they should be used to survey areas of high risk and try to buffer a particular state from expected but also unforecastable introductions. And so you should look at your, the risk maps we're going to show, say to yourself, okay, well, it's risky here, but we don't necessarily know when or if lanternfly will ever actually get there, but it's more likely it'll get to those risky areas. And then finally, predictive modeling needs many different models. And so you're going to see three different models, three different ways that we've been approaching the lanternfly. And because if you have lots of different models, then you increase your accuracy of risk assessments and you also increase your precision. And so we want to combine different types of models in order to make a really good estimate of lanternfly uh, spread and impact. And so the final take home message is that anytime that you're thinking about forecasting, just like they do in climate forecast or weather forecast, you have to compare multiple models and applications like what we've developed uh, when designing your response to the spot of lanternfly invasion. And even when understanding it, and many of you just wanna understand it as well. So I'm gonna pass this off then um, to the next three speakers, Stephanie and Dadej and, and Seva. And they're gonna be, be walking you through then uh, the different models that they have uh, personally developed um, uh, uh, with, with, with all of us collaborating together with some mathematicians and other people uh, and other people uh, in, in the field. And we're gonna address our questions at the end of the presentations, but be sure and type in any questions you have in the Q&A. We might uh, be able to address them uh, as we go. Otherwise, we'll, we'll have a discussion at the end about the things that we talk about. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Um, okay. Can are my slides visible? Okay, great. Okay. Thank you for that great introduction, Matt. Um, so my name is Stephanie, and I am a postdoc at Temple University uh, in the math department and the integrative ecology lab. And today I'm going to talk to you about computing the temperature dependent reproductive number of the spotted lanternfly. So this is joint work that I conducted uh, with Seba, who's going to talk later, as well as Matt and Benjamin Seibold, one of our collaborators in the math department. Okay. So the fundamental question that I'm going to ask today is, if a group of spotted lanternflies arrives in a location, will the climate in that location support year-to-year -year population growth? So really, if a group of eggs, or it could be um, motiles, it could be juveniles, egg layers, individuals in any life stage, just arrives in a new place by any means at all, will the climate allow the population to grow or will they die off? Will they um, oscillate? Will they stay at equilibrium, et cetera? What is the fate of that population going to be? So I'm really looking at the growth component uh, that Matt brought up in his introduction a little while ago. That's what we're focusing on here. Okay. So the modeling strategy that we're going to use is we're going to tackle this question with a mathematical model, in particular, a PDE or partial differential equations model. And uh, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail right now about what that is, but I'll say a bit more later. And of course, we can talk about it in the Q&A session at the end as well. So the basic premise of our modeling efforts are that the population dynamical behavior that you see, that is the, the 
trajectory of the population over time, how the count of individuals changes, whether it grows, whether it declines, really results from the interplay between the climatic conditions that the population experiences and the inherent biology so their tolerance for cold and heat, the rate at which they develop, which is sensitive to temperature, uh, the rate at which they lay eggs, et cetera. And so what we do is we first model climatic conditions. And in this work, we're going to focus specifically on temperature. So there are, of course, other factors that affect their populations, like precipitation, soil moisture, et cetera. But we're just going to look at the primarily at the effects of temperature right now, which is one of the, the really key climatic factors. And then we model development, egg laying, and mortality rates. And we also model dormancy, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. And we really look at how these different factors of climatic conditions come together to create the population dynamical behavior. And we compute explicitly population counts over time. And so in terms of dormancy, we're really interested in focusing on the diapause stage. So diapause is a life stage that SLF potentially go through. And it's a period of cessation of development and metabolic activity that they experience as eggs. And they typically go through diapause in the winter and it really protects them from extreme cold temperatures. And it also synchronizes the population for future egg laying. And so one thing that we are particularly interested in that I'll draw a lot of attention to uh, when I show you the results is how do diapause versus non-diapause population dynamics differ? So that is, if I look at a population that does experience diapause in the winter versus one that doesn't, uh, how would the outcomes be different for the two of them in the same climate potentially? Okay, so the reproductive number that I mentioned on the first slide, the reproductive number R0 is a measure of population growth. This is very similar in spirit to the reproductive number, for instance, that we've been talking about with COVID for the last couple of years and virus dynamics in general. Uh, so the, the, the definition that we're working with is that it's the number of SLF present in a subsequent year divided by the number present in the previous year. So said otherwise, the number of lanternflies in a subsequent year per lanternfly present in the previous year. And so based on this definition, we can intuit R0 serves as a binary measure of growth and decline. So if R0 is less than one, you have fewer lanternflies every year than you had the previous year. And of course the population is declining. If it's equal to one, we're at equilibrium. And if it's greater than one, you have more lanternflies every year than you had previously. So the population is growing. And the really important thing to stress here is that we are looking at R0 as it depends on climate. So it's not just one number that works for any lanternfly population under any circumstances anywhere in the world. We are really looking at its dependence on climate and in a sense, thinking of it as a function of climate. So as I mentioned before, there are many climatic variables that affect R0, but we're focusing on temperature. And the way that we model temperature in our model is like this. So this is on the left is the explicit function. So capital T is temperature as a function of little t time. And this is a graph of the temperature profile we're working with for one year. And you see that it's determined entirely by the two variables, H, which is the annual mean, and G, which is the annual amplitude. And what we're going to do is compute R0 as a function of those two parameters, H and G, the annual mean and amplitude. So we're really doing a two-dimensional parameter sweep. Okay, so in terms of the actual model that we're working with, I'll say a little bit more about it now. It's called a stage age structured PDE or partial differential equation. Um, and just to give a, a general overview of the framework of what a model like this looks like, here's a schematic diagram of the particular it is a version that we're working with. And so we take the full lanternfly population and split it up into four stages. So the sessile egg stages, which is uh, non-diapause eggs, ones that start to develop immediately after they're laid without going through diapause. And then we have eggs that are going through diapause and eggs that are developing post-diapause after diapause is complete. 
And then on the right, we have the motiles, which is everything that has hatched. So in stars or the juveniles, and then young adults, and finally egg layers. And for each of these life stages, we develop a collection of functions that describe the rates of underlying biological processes that those subpopulations experience. So for instance, um, we have a function lambda, which depends on temperature and is the rate of development, so how fast they move through each of these life stages. Then we have a function m, which is the mortality rate and also depends on temperature. And then another function k of a, which is the egg laying rate. Here a, I haven't defined yet, but it's a an age variable. It's the, the age in age, stage age structure PDE, and it's a variable that tells you how far through the life stage an individual has advanced. And so in the diagram that you see here, we're looking at the diapause version of our model. So it assumes that eggs laid in the summer and fall go here into the diapause basket. And then those laid in the winter and spring go into non-diapause and just bypass diapause and start developing right away. And when we look at the non-diapause system, we just eliminate this bottom branch and assume that all individual, or sorry, all eggs that are laid at any time of year go straight into the non-diapause basket. Okay, so now we're going to look at some heat maps um, showing our, um, <coughs> sorry, showing our computations of R naught across this HG parameter suite. So here is the diapause case. So this is our parameter domain. On the horizontal axis, we have the annual mean temperature H, and on the vertical axis, we have the annual amplitude G. So this white curve that you see is the level curve on which R0 is 1. So that's where the population would be at equilibrium. And then if you are outside of the curve, the population declines because R0 is less than 1. And if you're inside the curve, it grows because R0 is greater than 1. And so, um, sorry, in, so to look at the, um, or the prediction, predicted value of R0 that we would get in any real world location, we simply take that location's temperature data and fit it to this sinusoidal model that we have and find the values of H and G that best fit the temperature profile in that place. And then just find where that is in the parameter domain. So here, for instance, is where New York would fall, kind of a moderate mean, moderate amplitude, like cold winters, hot summers, et cetera. And then Los Angeles, for instance, would fall down here because it has a high mean and there's not much variation, right? So the amplitude is lower. So here are some additional locations across the US. And in fact, everything inside of this dotted curve uh, basically consists of the temperature profiles that we find in the continental United States. And so, you know, looking at this, we see if we look in the low mean area, we see places like Denver, Hawaii, the northern Midwest, Minnesota, and Iowa, where there's very little to no establishment potential. And then if we look at the moderate mean area, we get some places like New York, Chicago, Wichita, Nashville, Napa Valley, some important agricultural regions that do have establishment potential. And then if we look in the higher mean area, we have Florida, Texas, you know, Southern California, places where the temperature is warm um, and very supportive of population growth. Okay, and so here's the same image in the non-diapause case. And one thing to note is that we're using the same the same axes as we had in the diapause case. So we go again from zero to 21, but I want you to think of this yellow region here as not representing a maximum of 21, but everything greater than or equal to 21. And in fact, in this yellow region in the lower right corner, the reproductive number is actually one to three orders of magnitude larger than it was in the same part of the diapause domain. And the reason for this is that in uh, climates that we said are generally warm, don't have much variation, are very hospitable to population growth, that don't need diapause, the population actually does a lot better because it is unencumbered by the developmental delays of the diapause process. And it's actually able to go through multiple generations and we get these really large R0 values. But you see the diapause trade-off when you look at the center of the domain. So now Nashville, Wichita, Chicago, New York, 
which um, did support population growth, you know, per the image on the left, are now in the population decline regime. Okay, so I'm going to finish with uh, some maps of R0 across the US. So now we're switching to proper geographic maps of the reproductive number. So on the left, we have the diapause model and on the right, the non-diapause model. And in the blue regions, that's where the population declines, where R0 is less than one. And in the red regions, that's where the population grows and R0 is greater than one. So by just looking at these and, and the heat maps we saw on the previous slide, we can derive some core messages about the potential for establishment across the US. So clearly diapause allows the population to move further north, right? We have much more red here in the diapause model on the left. And diapause supports growth in several agricultural regions and major metropolitan areas. But as we saw in the heat map on the previous slide, when uh, the population is able to survive without diapause, it tends to be able to grow at a higher rate than the populations that need diapause to survive do. Okay, so in terms of our current work, uh, now is what happens when we add randomness to the temperature model? So this is the temperature model that I showed you before, which is what we've been working with. And we're looking at what happens when you add a bit of stochasticity, right? So to make it look a little bit more like real temperature data and how does this cause the population trajectories and change to the population counts over time? And how much does it start to deviate from that R naught? And then in terms of our upcoming work, we're going to be looking at uh, mathematical ways to design optimally effective strategies for implementing different common control methods for the lantern plot. Okay, so that is all from me. Thank you so much for listening. And now I'm going to pass it off to Nadej. Thank you, Stephanie. So let me share my screen. Okay. Hi everyone, um, I am Nadej Birwa. I am also a postdoc and my research, my research is on the movement of invasive species in general. Um, so after Stephanie talked about whether a population would be able to persist when it arrives in a, in a, in a location, I'm going to talk about where a spotted lantern fly populations could arrive and spread. So um, through germ dispersal. So first I'm going to define germ dispersal. If I can go to the next slide. Yes, there it is. So when um, a species arrives in a new area, it will first uh, spread in a continuous way that is called diffusive spread. But at the same time, um, some populations can establish far away from this core invasion in a process that is called germ dispersal because of human assisted dispersal, that is the involuntary transport of the species or voluntary, but in our case, it's involuntary. So it can be as eggs, as nymphs or as adults, but the population is just introduced somewhere else. The problem is that um, these populations can spread in a continuous way too. So it's a real concern because it means that secondary invasions can appear very far away from the initial uh, invasion. And in, in when we study um, biological invasions, we there are different questions associated with diffusive spread and germ dispersal. Because in the case of diff diffusive spread, we don't really um, have questions about where the invasion is going to spread because it's going to be right next to it in a continuous way. And the questions are more, how fast is it going to spread or what are the limits of the spread? In the case of germ dispersal, it's much more unpredictable. And so the real question is, where is germ dispersal going to happen? And so we are going to address this question in three steps. First, we need to find these germs. And it's not as easy as it sounds. I'm going to show you that in a second. The second thing is, once we know where the germs are, um, Germ dispersal is linked to human activity. So um, when we know the germ, germ locations are going to be found right next to the infrastructures that led them here. So um, once we have the location of these germs, we can find the infrastructures that are associated to germ dispersal. 
And finally, once we have accumulated this knowledge, we can predict future jumps based on past jumps. So here is a map of uh, established spotted lantern fly populations as of 2020. So you can see this huge cluster of points that is the diffusive spread. And you can see other points here and there, and we need to determine which of them are jumps. So in some cases, it's really easy, like this point with the black arrow, because it's far away from any other point. So yes, that's probably a jump. But in some other cases, it's much more complicated. For example, here, uh, we have this cluster of points, and what likely happened here is that there was an original jump and, a jump, and that was followed by a secondary invasion. So we need to trace back um, using data from previous years, what was the original point to find the location where it was. And here we have another case. So we have these two points here, and apparently they could be jumped, they, they could be jumped because um, they are away from this diffusive uh, spread from, from the limit of the diffusive spread here. There is a gap between the two. But we need to make sure that the, this gap was actually surveyed because it could be just an artifact. And if it's not surveyed, it could still, it could still be diffusive spread. So we need to make sure that there are surveys in this gap. So it gets, um, so we developed a method uh, with rigorous criteria to do that. So first we start from the introduction point, we pick a year and a direction, and we find the invasion front, so the limit of diffusive spread. We make sure that there are negative surveys beyond these points, and we list the points that are beyond this, this gap as jumps. We repeat that for all the directions, and we validate these jumps with rotations of the, of the direction because the invasion front is heterogeneous. Then we repeat all these steps for the next year and we remove points that were already found uh, close to uh, the previous year, because as I said before, that can be just secondary diffusion. So as you can see, because of the huge number of points here, it gets really complicated really quickly. There are many years, a lot of points. So we develop an algorithm that does all of that automatically in just under 40 seconds. And we're going to publish that so that other people can use that for other species as well. So in terms of results, uh, here are the jumps that were found by the algorithm. So there are 139 jumps that were found. And you can see uh, that some of them were found in the Pittsburgh area, area in 2019. Um, and something that we can observe here is that there are clusters of points. We have two hypotheses about these points. The first one is that multiple jumps have happened the same year, but the alternative hypothesis is that there was only one original jump and it, the, the population spread the same year or it spread the year before it was discovered. So in total, we have 42 distinct locations, including 15 of these clusters. What's interesting is that the number of jumps increases, the number of new jumps increases every year. So jump dispersal is a real concern. And what's also interesting is that when we measure the distance between the invasion front and the jump location, this distance does not increase over time. And that is going to be really helpful when we want to predict future jumps later in the third part. Now that we know where the jumps are, um, we can investigate their location relative to infrastructure types in different ways. So I'm going to talk about uh, the, like we can measure the distance between jumps and these infrastructure types. And for example, if we look at, we look at median distance between jumps and railroads and roads, um, jump locations are uh, less than 400 meters from railroads and roads, but they are more than two kilometers away from distribution centers and um, popular destinations, including, for example, stadiums. But the question is, how significant is that? Is that far? Is that close? We need to compare these values to something else. So we calculated a risk estimate based on the how close jumps were from infrastructure types, and we compared that to a null distribution of random points. 
So in this table, you have uh, the list of all the infrastructure, type, infrastructure types that are significantly linked with jump locations. Um, the higher the risk estimate, the more likely jump locations are going to be found close to this infrastructure type. So as you can see, um, railroads have a very high risk estimate of 9.9 .9 compared to, for example, primary airports that have only a coefficient of 3.5. But remember, as I said, they are all significantly associated with jump dispersal. It's just that the risk estimate allows us to um, hierarchize or prioritize some particular infrastructure types for surveys because we cannot survey the whole territory. So we need to prioritize some locations. And you can find this table in the High Risk Properties app that is on the SLF dashboard. Another way to look at the data um, is to compare the distance to the nearest infrastructure between jump locations, diffusive spread locations, and uninvaded locations. So here, for example, for major roads and railroads. What we found, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see the boxes better, um, is that jump locations are situated much closer um, to major roads than diffusive spread locations and uninvaded locations. In the case of railroads, jump both jump locations and diffusive spread locations are situated closer to railroads than uninvaded locations. But it's even more the case for jump locations. So in both cases, there is a particular link um, between these two infrastructure types and jump, jump locations. Now that we have accumulated all this data, all, all this knowledge about past jumps, we can use that to predict high-risk locations by transposing this data from past jumps around infrastructures um, at, that are at high risk in the form of risk buffers. So for example, here, you remember um, I said that the, the distance between the invasion front and um, jump locations is stable over time. It's, it stays the same. So here I have made a yellow buffer uh, that corresponds to the general area where we expected to see jump, jump uh, dispersal, dispersal jumps in, in 2021 based on data up until 2020. Um, and more specifically, the red buffer here um, is the, the, the specific risk buffer for railroads, because we saw that in both analysis that I showed you, it was the, the infrastructure type with the, the, that was at the highest risk of, of dispersal jumps. And this um, data can be used to choose or, or prioritize some locations, some specific locations to survey um, um, to attempt to eradicate these new populations early, because this is the key for um, control in the case of invasive species. The earlier they are detected, the better the chances are to eradicate these populations. Thank you for your attention, and I will pass it on to Seba. All right, thank you, Nadesh. I'm gonna just get the presentation started. Can everybody see my screen? Is it in presentation mode? All right, okay. Um, so what I'll try to do today um, is to give you a bit of a um, sort of a summary view of uh, what we've been doing at the um, IE Collab with Spotted Lanternfly and also a little bit of what we learned. Seba, um, we're not seeing your your slides, so switch the screen. We're seeing your oh. presentation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I will fix that. Let me see. Thank you, Matt, for saying that. Thanks, Matt. You got on there just just before I unmuted myself. <laughs> Here we go. Is this any better? Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So yeah, what I was what I was saying is, I'll I'll try and give a little bit of a of a summary of what we have been doing at the ICO lab uh, with regards to spotted lanternfly and also uh, a little bit of uh, lessons learned. Uh, we've been dealing with the species and studying it for a while and so we want to gather some uh, relevant insights that we can apply to um, spotted lanternfly in other areas but also to um, other species, um, other invasive species in the future. And so 
uh, I'll, be, I'll be talking about a framework that we developed to document and forecast the spread of uh, recent invasive species, focusing, uh, as I mentioned, on, on the spotted lanternfly, of course. Um, so to give sort of a bit of a schematics of um, how uh, a new invasive population is discovered and then what that information is, um, is going into, uh, of course, the first step is for this species to be, to be found. Um, and as Matt was mentioning earlier, the spotted lanternfly was first found uh, in 2014 in Berks County, Pennsylvania. Since then, a lot of data has been collected to, as, as to where this species is present um, each year. Um, and that data is collected, collected through field uh, surveys. Once the data is collected, then it gets processed. And this entails two uh, different steps. The first one is to gather the data, so to collect uh, those either electronic or uh, physical sheets that uh, contain information on um, where that species is found. And also this data comes from a variety of different sources. Uh, a lot of people are looking into the species. This is very interesting. It's, it's very impactful and potentially dangerous to agriculture. So uh, different agencies um, are, are looking into where the species is found. And once this data is uh, gathered, then it also needs to be aggregated and harmonized. Harmonized is just a fancy way to say uh, data that comes from different uh, sources that looks differently uh, needs to be put into a way that, that can be uh, combined between the different sources in, 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 a, in a clever way. Once we have this, this sort of big mass of data, what are we doing with it? Well, we at the iCollab um, are, are fitting a variety of different models. Uh, Stephanie and Nadesh already have mentioned a couple. I'll be mentioning a, a few more. And these models sort of fall under two different categories. One is to try and fill spatial gaps. Um, and this is done because no matter how many resources we can pour into studying an invasive species, these resources like time and, and money and energy are limited, space is um, infinite. And so the amount of data we can collect is never going to be perfect. There are going to be gaps in it. Um, and so how do we fill those gaps? And then, um, of course, the second aspect of feeding models is to forecast spread. So we know now where lanternfly are, and we have a good idea of where they were yesterday. But of course, we have very little information on where they will be uh, tomorrow in a year, uh, and of course, in, uh, in even longer time spans. And so how do we, how do we address that? And with this model then, of course, um, we need to share this information. Uh, communicating insights is a crucial aspect of uh, doing science, of course. Um, the way we do it at the, at the IE Collab is mainly through two um, aspects. The first, we publish uh, a lot of uh, interactive maps. Uh, I'm sure there are going to be uh, in the chat, and if not, I will, I will provide links to them um, later on. And those maps can be, um, can be observed by anyone who wants to. And then another aspect is to provide estimates of risk. You've heard a little bit of it from Nadesh when she was describing the risk of, of future jump dispersal events. But of course, risk can be interpreted in many different ways. And so we'll look at another example of that in just a moment. What do we do with that insight? Well, the final goal, the end goal, is to provide information that goes into control actions. Um, we want to inform people going out into the field that sort of reduce populations of lanternfly, especially in locations where lanternfly has, has provided or is, or is causing um, harm. And of course, the same information can be um, fed back into the field survey. For example, defining what areas we have little information about, where we would like to explore more on, on where lanternfly is, or what kind of locations, uh, like Nadesh was describing, what, uh, what location types should um, uh, field surveys focus on. So I'll go through um, this uh, quite quickly. Uh, I, I want to leave enough space for, for questions from the audience later on. But let's um, sort of, uh, as, a, as, a, as an idea of the structure, there's sort of two components here. One is the field effort that has to do with the field surveys and the control action. And the other one is the data science aspect, which is what uh, we do at the IE Collab, whereas the field effort is conducted by uh, state agencies and, and federal federal agencies. So I'll focus on uh, this bottom part for this presentation, and we'll start by looking at the way we think about uh, processing data. 
So the first step, as I mentioned before, is to gather this data. And this data comes from a variety of different places. Um, the PDA, the Pennsylvania Depart Department of Agriculture, was the first one to step up and start collecting data on the presence of SLF. Uh, and until 2018, it was the only agency that was collecting data for, uh, on SLF presence. But after that, a bunch of other states, of course, when Antrify uh, got there, started collecting data on it as well. Um, there is also a good amount of data that is collected by citizens. There's a lot of citizen science projects that are um, uh, still ongoing. Um, and this is a great way for people to contribute their knowledge uh, to, to the cause. So I will actually add later on uh, a link to the uh, Pennsylvania public reporting tool where people can actually uh, report sightings they had of spotted lanternfly in their properties or in locations they have visited. There's another uh, component to it, which is iNaturalist. That's a, a, an app that people can have on their phone and they can record sighting of species they maybe don't know uh, about. And that information gets validated by other users. Most of them are either scientists or people that have uh, either formal or informal, informal training on identifying species. And so that information is vetted and it, that information comes with, uh, with uh, geographical location. So we can uh, sort of track back where lanternfly was sighted, which means it probably was there and, and established. And then finally, a big, uh, big um, um, provider of data, uh, especially since 2018, uh, is the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, who's been collecting data and gathering data together um, for the past few years. What we do with the data once we get it? Well, uh, we, and I say we at the Haiko Lab, uh, take this raw data, uh, we receive it, we store it in a safe location. Then we also check whether there were any mistakes or errors, whether any data was missing. We follow up on that and try and get the, the best quality data that we can get. Um, we then do this data harmonization. So we try and make data that comes from different places as similar to each other as possible so we can combine it in one big data set. Um, and once we do that, we, we sort of derive this aggregated data set and we can export it, we can share it with other researchers uh, and we can also work on it. A lot of the data is at the base of what um, Stephanie and, and Nadesh uh, were, were showing earlier in terms of their, their efforts. This final data contains some crucial informations. Some of them are the geolocation, latitude and longitude. Some of them are the date. We want to know when that information was collected. Some of it was where this data, this data came from. Was it um, a citizen science project? Was it uh, a state agency? And then of course we have biological information on SLF whether SLF was just present there as a one-off sighting, whether a, an established population was present in that location. And sometimes we also have information on how many spotted lanternfly were present there. And we have that on a, on a ordinal scale from unpopulated to high density of the population of SLF there. And if we sort of put this data into a geographic array, uh, it will look something like this. This is data uh, up to 2021. Um, and you'll see in warmer colors are uh, more recent sightings uh, and the gray crosses represent points that are negative surveys where actually people have gone out and have recorded the absence of SLF. And those points are very important because we also want to know uh, where we can be fairly certain SLF is not present. And if we split up the data by the different sources we, we uh, um, receive the data from, you can see that the, state's depart the state departments of agriculture contribute to a lot of the data, especially at the beginning with PDA being the, the biggest uh, shareholder of that data. And then the USDA has been collecting a lot of data since. Um, you can see that there's a little blue sliver uh, with data that is contributed by iNaturalist. And what I wanna focus on is this sort of uh, uh, green wedge at the bottom, which represents the amount of space that has overlapped information. And this is important for two things. First of all, it's good to have validation. It's good to have information that comes from several different sources and, and hopefully agrees, uh, that hopefully agree with each other. Uh, but also the amount of overlap is relatively small. So if we hadn't gone out and try and, and found this data from all these different sources, we would have missed out on quite a bit of information in terms of the, the spatial extent of the knowledge of where SLF is present today. We're gonna move quickly to the second step, uh, fitting models. And again, here uh, I'm going to, uh, provide some different examples um, uh, that are different to what Nadesh and, and Stephanie have already shown. 
first of all, we're going to talk about spatial gaps. So this map that I'm showing here on the left is very pretty. It looks like we have a lot of information. But of course, this information is very, is very uh, refined. We're, we're looking at uh, sort of a meter scale level where it's, it's, it's very sort of geographically high resolution. We have a lot of space in between that has received no surveys. We have no idea um, what the status of this point um, in the middle is. We, we, we're not sure whether Lantabai is present there or, or not. And so how do, we, uh, how do we derive that information? Uh, one way to do it is to use spatial interpolation. And this is a mathematical technique that tells us uh, in a given location where I have no information, um, can I derive a probability of a spotted lanternfly being present based uh, on the surrounding areas? So I don't know nothing about this specific location, but I do know that lanternfly was present um, around it, or maybe it was absent around it. And so I can uh, condense that information and try and derive a, uh, uh, a new interpolated data for that specific unknown or unsurveyed location. And we can do that over most of the invasion range. Here you can see on this uh, blue to yellow scale, blues are locations where a lanternfly is very unlikely to be present. And that's both due to uh, data that shows that it's absent and also uh, data around a given location that shows that it's absent. And then you can see those uh, yellow dots are uh, where SLF is uh, present with certainty. Um, areas in between, like for example, around um, this area in Maryland, we know that lanternfly is present in some locations, so it might be present. We have sort of about a 60% a likelihood that it would be present around it. For some locations, you'll notice this big, bright yellow spot here in Indiana. When we have very little information on whether lanternfly is present, well, that's, that information is going to cause the neighboring areas, uh, it's, it's going to swamp the neighboring areas with its sort of loud signal. And so we have to be cautious about those areas where we have little information. One way to do it, and I won't show it now, is to define a trust measure that tells us, okay, let's only focus on locations where we have had at least a certain amount of surveys. So we can uh, say for certain whether SLF is present or, or what's the, the, uh, the certainty we have on that location. We're gonna talk very briefly um, about forecasting spread and because uh, both Stephanie and Adesh have, have shown some data on it. Um, the, the model that Stephanie was showing is a very uh, intense, very detailed model with a lot of nuance, and it's called a bottom-up model. We're sort of trying to infer what the uh, population level dynamic is from individual level uh, properties. We're saying, well, individuals uh, survive or die at certain temperatures, so what will the population do? Another way to build models is to build them from the top down, to look at big patterns and then try and derive uh, insight from those. Um, and Dr. Hema Hudgens at, at Carleton University, one of our collaborators, has done something very similar, building what's called a generalized dispersal kernel model. This is a, a mouthful of words. But what it means is that we can use general knowledge on other forest pest species that we have a lot more data on that have been around for a much longer time. Um, and we can predict what the behavior of a novel species will be um, if we assume that these species share some, at least some traits with. Um, uh, with the um, uh, previous um, pest, forest pest species. And so we can take data of spotted lanternfly today and in the past, and we can try and project that uh, in the future to, to forecast what, uh, where lanternfly will be next. You can see here in the red area is where lanternfly was in 2020. And then we can forecast uh, in, in five year intervals where lanternfly will be. And these are these black dots, which are uh, 50 kilometer square uh, grids. And you'll see that some, um, some is very sort of expected behavior. We'll see uh, sort of a, uh, an expansion through that diffusion spread that Mdesh was talking about, but some of them are uh, jump events that are quite far away, like in this case, for example, um, in Illinois or, or over here in, in Massachusetts. So um, we'll, we'll uh, gather some insight that is sort of unexpected that has, that has to do with those jump locations. And once again, this is a different technique, a different method to infer jump locations. As Matt was saying, this is not certain uh, truth. This is a, a potential outcome. And as Matt was saying, once again, this has to be taken in addition to other um, modeling frameworks uh, to see where we have agreements, where different models say the same thing, then we can be fairly certain that um, that 
occurrence as high likelihood of happening. And finally, I just want to go uh, quickly through the communication aspect of things. We're going to look at two parts, the published maps uh, that I'll refer you to again. Uh, there's going to be a, a link uh, in the chat and then uh, some estimations of risk. When it comes to, to um, publishing maps, we are, we're very active in, uh, with that at the IECO lab. We've published a, a, a lot of maps on this uh, dashboard. You can find the, the link to it here. Uh, and this not only has maps of both past uh, and forecasted future spread of spotted lanternfly, but also uh, a lot of other um, resources that um, people can uh, consult um, when it comes to spotted lanternfly. Um, you'll, the landing page is going to look something like this, and you see here in the bottom, you can choose which kind of uh, applications you want to, to browse. And then um, looking at one of them, for example, the forecast is going to have a, a bunch of different panels that you can, uh, that you can browse. Um, and most of them are interactive. And then finally, uh, risk is something that we really care about. We want to know locations that are at risk, and also we want to know how risk is changing through time. And one way to do it is to combine information that we have on locations that are uh, of value for us and, and uh, the prediction of where lantern flight will be in the future. So we can combine uh, our um, um, filling of the spatial gaps for spatial interpolation and the presence of locations of interest. Like in this case, in purple are uh, vineyards and in blue are uh, important transport locations. And we can follow through time how the spread of SLF has incorporated more and more locations of interest, like vineyards and, um, uh, and transport hubs. Um, we can gather this information on vineyards um, uh, through uh, consulting a, 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 um, a series of different um, um, platforms. And we've done that through the um, great work of the undergrad students at the ICO lab. And then we can put it together with the information we have on the spatial interpolation and see what the profile of risk through time is, which is here in this bottom right corner. Um, and you'll see here something that is interesting is the impact of winery, wineries in Pennsylvania has sort of grown relatively linearly. It's just been going, it's been going up for, uh, for a while since the species was introduced. But if you look at the risk of transport, there's sort of a really hard uh, kink around 2017, where this uh, very sort of flat increase in risk then really takes a sharp um, exponential growth. And that's because uh, the area around Pennsylvania and then Pittsburgh have been um, invaded in those uh, at that time, which means now SLF is in locations that are crucial points for transport elsewhere. And so we need to be careful when those sharp um, events occur. That means that we're looking at potential jump uh, dispersals uh, down the line in other locations. The last thing I want to say, and it has to do with trying to learn from a species, um, is we have done all this for spotted lanternfly and with spotted lanternfly in mind, but of course this type of framework can be applied to any other species that is, is first found uh, in a given area. And having this framework built already allows us to be very quick at responding to uh, novel pest species that um, are found in a given location. And with this, I want to thank um, you for, for listening and of course, uh, all uh, our collaborators. And I think we'll move on to um, answering any questions you might have. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all of those uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, so I know that several people have put some questions in the Q&A box and Matt has been feverishly uh, typing some responses to those, uh, but we have plenty of time for questions. So any of the questions that you have, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box and uh, we will address those. Uh, just to, uh, maybe we can do a quick recap here because I know maybe not everybody saw the questions uh, as they came in. Uh, so maybe uh, just briefly, uh, we can go go back and hit some of these. Uh, so Phyllis asked, do they fly? And uh, so Matt put a, a great description in there, but could you recap that for us real quick, Matt? 
Yeah, they fly. They are called lantern flies, right? So they definitely fly. They don't fly very well, though. Um, they're pretty poor flyers. If you think of like a bee or a dragonfly, I mean, they're not flying around like that. Um, they climb up really tall objects. And so at least, uh, you know, on Temple University, we've seen them climbing up huge buildings and you'll see them right at the top of buildings. And then um, they'll catch the wind and they'll glide. They'll fly, you know, pretty far that way. And and they can go hundreds and hundreds of yards that way. Um, and so they're not strong flyers, but they do disperse pretty well and they can go pretty far. So they'll keep climbing up something tall, flying, you know, kind of glide flying down, climb up something tall again and keep moving that direction if they want to. Great. Uh, <clears throat> so we have some uh, notes coming in here that uh, you cannot copy the chat. Uh, so Kathleen, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, Zoom is a little weird about copying things uh, out of the chat. We will be sure to put those links in the description of the YouTube video. Uh, whenever we post that, it should be up later this week. Uh, so if you haven't uh, subscribed to our YouTube channel, that's going to be uh, very easy. Just go to YouTube, search Carnegie Science Center, and we should be one of the first things that comes up. So uh, you can find this video right there. And I would also guess that um, you could uh, find these links at the IECO Lab website. Uh, and if you click on the links, it should open it up for you in a new browser window. So at the very least, uh, go ahead and click those links, and you should be able to copy that address and share it if you're going to share it with some other folks. Uh, that way. Perfect. Uh, so let's hit one other uh, question here that, uh, that maybe not everyone got a chance to uh, see the response to. This one's from Brian. Is it possible to push invasive species like SLF out of an area they've jumped to or are efforts focused on slowing its spread elsewhere? So I think that was one that uh, a lot of folks are are going to be thinking about here too. Yeah, um, if anybody, Nadez, Seba, Stephanie, if you know anything, I can really only think of one instance where lanternfly was eradicated from a jump location. This was further north, I believe it was in New Hampshire, could be Vermont, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's in one location there. Um, I did find a, a very small population, but they were able to eradicate it relatively quickly. It's possible that it would have died out as well just with the winters up there. Um, and that's really the only case that I know of where there's been actual eradication of, of a known jump event. Um, for the most part, these jump events that we're seeing have been in locations where they grow really fast and really rapidly. And uh, in that case, we, we can't, we have to live with lanternfly. I think we all have to say that, you know, that, that this is something where we are slowing the spread because if you slow the spread, then it gives researchers uh, enough time to try and come up with um, effective control strategies. You know, thinking about, you know, sort of having a, you know, an, um, uh, a vaccine for a lanternfly because there are people who literally are working on on these types of ideas, these types of pesticides that don't harm the environment, these types of control measures, how you manage the landscape. So by slowing the spread, you essentially give researchers uh, and the USDA and state agricultural departments uh, enough time to try and come up with better solutions of how to mitigate the impacts and how to mitigate those impacts once they get to California, once they get to uh, the Finger Lakes region, uh, you know, in upstate New York, those sort of areas where there is a lot of um, agriculture important vineyards. And so that's sort of what we're trying to do is slow the spread here. Great. Uh, so we have a question here from John. Uh, was the jump dispersal route most likely the PA Turnpike? So we cannot, definitely identify the path that was taken. So, because we don't know the origin or, I mean, our method only allows us to identify the destination of, of the jump dispersal, but not the origin, like where does it come from and what, what, what route was taken. What we can identify is where is that jump dispersal location? So what is it close to, for example? So I don't have the answer to this question, I'm sorry, um, but, Yes, I mean, the, the, one of the principal um, infrastructure type that is associated with jump dispersal is roads, major roads, for example. So it's likely that it's been transported. It might be one of the ways it be, it's been transported, maybe not the, the major one, but it probably contributed to it if, um, like for the jump between maybe Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. 
So there's the the turnpike, and you mentioned the uh, the railroads before as another you know avenue. Uh, and I know that around here in southwestern Pennsylvania, we see Tree of Heaven all along the riverbanks. And so I would imagine too, they're they're following uh, the rivers that can go up the tributaries and and spread further up into the forests that way. Um, so uh, yeah, it's this is the first year that we've got a really uh, good look at them here in Pittsburgh. And so I know a lot of folks are uh, seeing them for the first time uh, and, and really interested in how they're getting to where they're getting. Uh, so here's a question from Kathleen. Do you know if chemical slash scented fly traps work on the spotted lantern fly? Okay, maybe I'll, if you wanna get it. No, I would love for you to go ahead if you know something about this. I remember, I think, I think it was one of the first um, ways of trapping um, researchers that looked into was to try and bait. Um, and I remember all the efforts to try and find an effective chemical bait to be pretty low. Um, they are good at finding trees uh, and, and they're good at finding each other. That's the other thing that, um, that we know. They congregate in these really high masses and that's likely due to the fact that um, once a few individuals find a tree they can tap into, um, other individuals will, will follow, especially adults. So currently, um, the, the best trapping techniques um, is uh, what's called a circle trap, which sort of envelops the trunk of the tree. It's a mesh, and that sort of funnels into usually a bottle or a bag. And because of what Matt was describing, there's some tendency to climb up, um, especially on tall objects and, and trees. Uh, they, will, they will start climbing the tree, and they will get caught into the funnel and then um, get caught into, into that. Uh, it's sort of, it's sort of a, 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 in a way, it's a bit of a downside that there isn't a chemical way to attract a lot of them. But on the other hand, there is already a chemical way to attract them, and it's the tree themselves. So once um, the traps are put on the trees, then they become very effective um, uh, attractants for them. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, you know, talking about the, the circle traps there, is that something that people can make themselves, or is that a product that people can purchase? Maybe both? I think both, and I think again in the in the dashboard, one of the resources we have, I think it's a um, a better description of how those traps are built. It really just takes some sort of like screen mesh, uh, 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 some some rope, and and a big gallon bottle. That's that's pretty much all it takes. It's a bit involved in terms of uh, of putting it together, but if someone is is good with uh, DIY projects, that's it's quite trivial to to uh, to make from sort of scrap material. So. So if you love crafting and hate invasive species, this is your call to action. Great, love it. Uh, so we have another question here from John. The top-down model forecast spread uh, to the far north, New England, et cetera. The temperature model said that was unlikely. I presume that the true risk is the blend of these two, greater risk to the south and less to the north. Yeah, I can jump in, in a, uh, again here. That's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a very good way to put it. That's exactly what we're trying to do is to try and put these models together. Uh, and of course, the, the good thing about these models is that they're giving us different information. The, the, the sort of top-down model gives us a good idea of where they will go next um, and, and what they can be attracted by. That model incorporates things like the presence of tree of heaven or population density human population density, which gives an idea of what the likelihood of transport is going to be between a location and the other. Forest cover is another uh, important aspect. So that's on the one side, that's the top uh, down model. And then Stephanie's model looks at much more nuanced uh, um, behaviors or patterns when it comes to temperature, which the previous model does not really incorporate. So you do need the two aspects and need to put them together. Um, if, if anything, this, this occurrence that Matt was mentioning in New Hampshire sort of gives us a really good thumbs up in that we're, we're, we're going somewhere with these models because it is telling us, yes, they might get to New Hampshire. That's, that's true. And that actually happened. But then once they get there, they might not be able to establish or they could be easy enough to eradicate due to the, to the slow population, population growth rate. So combining those models is, is, is crucial. It's really not a great idea to just look at one solution and say and that's going to be uh, the sort of like the ground truth. Um, we need to, to do more research and put together more models to compare them. Great. Okay, we have a question here from Christopher. 
Uh, we experienced the beginnings of the gypsy moth uh, outbreaks in New England, and there's a note there, sorry, it uh, doesn't know the, the new accepted uh, common name for that species. Uh, those had a cycle of larger outbreaks on an eight to 12 year pattern. Do you think the spotted lanternfly might have uh, a cyclical outbreak uh, or maybe it will just be constant inundation? Or maybe there's not enough data to know yet. I don't know, Stephanie, do you want to talk about chaotic dynamics or anything like that from a mathematics perspective? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really speculative what, what's going to happen, right? So. Yeah. Sure, yeah, I would say that in some in some parts of the like in the of my perimeter domain and in some parts of the United States, we would see a growth pattern that is relatively constant from year to year in the sense that like they're repeating the same phenological pattern from one year to the next but either they're growing the population is growing in magnitude or declining in magnitude but in some places in particular in the south in the warmer climates that are more hospitable um, we our model predicts that they could go through um, there could be like multiple generations per year that are going through um, diapause populations and also non-diapause populations simultaneously and this creates a sort of chaotic behavior where the population would oscillate pretty dramatically um i don't have anything that sort of indicates that the population would kind of really subside and kind of be hiding out somewhere you know in some dormant sense and then suddenly come back um after maybe appearing to be eradicated if that's sort of what the i'm not sure what the the uh, exactly what happened with the uh, gypsy moth but yeah we definitely there there's definitely a possibility for an, an erratic oscillation in terms of the population count great and we just posted a little bit of information there about that uh, species name the uh, the new common name for that is the spongy moth uh, so there you have it and let's see, Kathy asks, uh, what is known about the native ranges uh, in Asia for spotted lanternfly and how can that help us uh, here in the US? I can jump in here because I really like this, um, this um, answering to these kind of questions. I think what's really great is that we have information of this species on um, its, its native range. There's a lot of studies also from other locations where it is invasive. A lot of the studies um, uh, that have to do, for example, with how lanternfly survives at different temperatures or how it gets through diapause come from uh, studies conducted in Korea. And Korea is another location where lanternfly is not native, it's been introduced and it, it has impacted uh, agriculture quite heavily there as well. Um, it's, it's a very interesting topic because we know that there have to be some biological mechanisms that just happen in a similar way in all the locations where lanternfly is present. But of course, because of uh, genetic drift, so small uh, changes in the way the population is, is um, um, here in the US as opposed to how it is in Korea or many other aspects of uh, sort of the environment here that are different to Korea, we cannot really take that information and apply it right away. We have to um, just sort of treat it with, with gloves a little bit. So, a lot of the data that we used to build the model that Stephanie has, um, there's a big contribution of data that comes from studies uh, uh, in Korea, but we also put that together with studies conducted here in the United States so that we have a, a more sort of general model that we can, uh, we can apply. So yes, there is a lot of information. Of course, we cannot just take it and apply right away. It needs to be taken with, with some care. And the other aspect that I think it's also very interesting is that a lot of the information comes from studies in the lab. And we know that lab conditions are very different from field conditions. There are a lot of sort of controlled factors in the lab that are very uh, erratic and stochastic in the field. And so the other aspect that we need to pay attention to is to put together both field studies and lab studies, which is something we do uh, in, in many of our models. Lab studies are great because they give us a very sort of narrow uh, perspective on something that goes on at a very small uh, biological scale but field studies are important because they capture really the, the complexity of the model as Matt was suggesting. Thank you, Seba. Uh, we have a comment here from Laura, not a question, but uh, hi, Laura, good to see you here. Uh, 
and Laura says that uh, she loves hearing from math folks on this subject. So, uh, and, and here at the Science Center, we we love uh, you know interdisciplinary work, and uh, so kudos uh, for for the math world getting involved with uh, with our invasive species here. Uh, and we have another question from Phyllis. And uh, don't worry, Phyllis, this one was not answered before. Uh, Phyllis wants to know if there are any species that eat the lanternfly. Uh, presumably, there are plenty that do in its home range, but I suspect Phyllis is more interested in uh, here in the US and Pennsylvania, what might be uh, predating on them. Sure, yeah, there's actually quite a few species, um, and native spiders, uh, native praying mantis, uh, a lot of birds that have been documented of eating lanternfly. Um, the problem is, is that when lanternfly feed on Tree of Heaven, they become toxic because Tree of Heaven itself has a lot of um, uh, really bad toxins in it. Like never cut down a Tree of Heaven and burn it because it could get you sick. So, so don't do that. Um, and so, so they can uh, take these, these toxins or sequester these toxins inside their body. Research at Penn State is starting to look at if you feed a lanternfly maple instead of feeding a lanternfly tree of heaven, do birds like to eat that that lanternfly more? And the answer is yes, they do. It does seem that that you know birds are, they find them more palatable. They actually start to attack them. Uh, they feed them their chicks. Um, and so as we cut down and remove tree of heaven, you know carefully. Um, uh, then the hope is that our natural ecosystem, all these predators, all these spiders, uh, all these birds will start to eat the lanternfly because there won't be anything toxic in them anymore. They'll be feeding all these plants that aren't toxic. Um, and so by, by maintaining sort of an intact ecosystem in your backyard, you know, anywhere there is to sort of really promote birds, promote all the biodiversity, all these predators, um, and then of course, removing tree of heaven from your property, that then can cause lanternfly populations to stay at a low level and not have these huge outbreaks that, that we were talking about. Great. And that is a very important note there about uh, burning tree of heaven, as in don't do it uh, if you value your health, uh, wonderful. Uh, I would imagine that, uh, you know, uh, there are ways that you can get rid of that either through municipal uh, yard waste collection uh, would probably be a good way. Uh, but if you've got a lot of it, I assume you could uh, contact some, some forestry professionals or arborists around you and they could uh, you know, guide you even better for your unique situation. Uh, so we have a couple more questions here. Uh, one from Marin. Uh, do the invasive uh, Chinese mantises also eat them in addition to our native mantises? I'm, I'm seeing some nods here. Yeah, what's really interesting about, and I mean, I know all three of us pro probably, or, or sorry, all, all four of us combined can talk about this. So we've seen them in the field, of course, eating, and there are plenty of YouTube videos and Twitter videos, and everything of them eating. The interesting thing is that lanternfly tree of heaven and the Chinese mantis all overlap their native range. And so they've all co-evolved with each other. And so, so that's sort of an interesting uh, thing here. We have sort of these, these three different um, food levels. We have the plant, we have the herbivore, and then we have the predator. And we've imported them all from China and they're here in Pennsylvania in, in the United States. So we do see that Chinese mantis eating a lot of the lanternfly. Great. Well, they are welcome to eat as many as they like. Uh, so we have another question here from Phyllis. Uh, so, and this I think uh, calls back to wondering about a cyclical nature of, of this population. Uh, and Phyllis recalls the invasive stink bugs that uh, used to show up in people's homes by the hundreds uh, a couple years back, but now we're not seeing a whole lot uh, of that. Uh, and, you know, you could probably think back to, to lots of invasive species and, you know, some of them seem to be here to stay and some of them seem to, to come and go, uh, but probably still a little early to, to call that here, I, it sounds like. Uh, so I'm going to exercise my host's prerogative and uh, ask a question of my own. Uh, and this will be a last call for questions. If anyone else in the audience has a, a question that you're wondering if you should ask, the answer is yes, please ask it. Uh, so my uh, observation you know, followed by you know, my question is we've, we've had so many invasive species here in Pennsylvania and across the US, zebra mussels, 
you've got uh, uh, tree pests like emerald ash borer, and you've got all these botanical uh, tree of heaven and stilt grass and, and all of these other things coming in. But I have never seen a, a, a public education, you know, campaign uh, get everyone to, to really know what this invasive species is until the spotted lanternfly. So, uh, so what do you think it is about the lanternfly that makes people seem to, to latch on to this thing? And, you know, it's, people are talking about it with their friends and family. And, you know, people ask, you know, us at the Science Center, you know, hey, I saw this, should I report it? Uh, so what, what, what do you think might uh, be leading to that? Is it just a charismatic, you know, neat looking bug? Or do you think we're doing something different uh, to get the word out about this invasive species and, and slowing it down? I, I think if it, I, I'll, I'll jump in, but then I don't want any, I want to steal away the chance to answer to, from anyone else. But I think what's really interesting is for lanternfly is sort of a perfect storm of, of what has happened. It is a very charismatic species. There isn't anything like it in Pennsylvania. Right. And so it's very easy to figure out, hey, this is a bug that I haven't seen before. And it's really bright and it flies in my face and it makes my yard all sticky. And so it's very, I think it's very easy to identify and it's very easy to, um, to recognize as something that, um, that you haven't seen before. And I think also the campaign to make people aware of it has been really, really strong. Uh, I moved to Philadelphia in 2020 where lanternfly was sort of starting to, to become a problem here. Um, and there were flyers everywhere. Um, I, I, I knew about it because I, I was starting a job on it, but um, it was very easy. It, it was very hard to like, to, to miss it, to not, not realize that this was happening. So I think it's, it's a combination of, it's really easy to educate people on this specific species um, a, a big campaign has been done to to educate people on it, and I'm I'm hoping to see this more, of course, um, uh, with other species in the future. Um, I think another aspect of it, information now is really easily transmittable. So if you find a bug that is uh, something you haven't seen before, it's very easy to uh, to look it up, to take a photo of it, to ask someone. So I think we're getting in a in a in a world where citizens are really involved in this. Um, it's not just about uh, sort of like forest specialists and researchers. Um, the public can be involved in, in finding and recognizing and in, um, in the early detection of these species, which is a, it's a great asset, I think. So I'm hoping this will, uh, will continue with other species in the future. There are going to be other invasive species in the future. I think that's a, that's, that's a reality we have to com become comfortable with. Um, it's good to be, to be prepared. Yeah, it, it seems that just, uh, you know, the, the very nature of, you know, human commerce just you know, builds the perfect uh, environment for invasive species to, uh, to thrive. And I know that, you know, we have, you know, cast our own share of invasive species out on the world too here from North America. So uh, don't anyone out there think that we are uh, just you know, pure victims here in the invasive species game. Uh, ask, ask people around the world what they think of bullfrogs. Uh, and I think the last comment we have here is from Marin uh, is, is a just comment about another crop pest invading from the South, uh, the Harlequin bug. Uh, also a very beautiful, charismatic, uh, you know, looking insect that uh, can, can lay waste to some crops. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, in the audience for being here with us tonight. Uh, Cafe Sci would literally be impossible without all of you. Uh, and I hope to see all of you, plus your family and friends and you know tolerated work companions uh, out at the next Cafe Sci. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Matt, Nadej, Stephanie, and Seba from the iEco Lab at Temple University for being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you for sharing your expertise with us and answering all these questions. Uh, and uh, I do hope that if you see some spotted lantern flies out there, you uh, you know are quick on your feet because they are <laughs> they're fast. So you got to really work to squish them sometimes. Uh, so that's it for us. We'll see you back on site at the Science Center in October, and we'll also stream that one live. 
uh, if you are unable to attend in person. Uh, so thanks again uh, to everyone here from Temple. And it will seem kind of awkward, but as soon as I stop recording, the whole session is going to end and it's going to go to black. Uh, so thanks again for being here. Uh, we'll see you all next month, everybody. Have a great night.